origin of Dogman. The Silvery Moon. The Lacey Brooks Pack. Let's get straight into that. More river wider than a mile. I'm crossing you in style someday. You dream maker, you heartbreaker. Wherever you're going, I'm going your way. Henry Mancini and Johnny Mercer. Adolescence has hit these two like a ton of bricks. The werewolf L. Brooks mused as he watched his adopted grandchildren play fight. They had, mostly, passed through their awkward phases and started to mature. Had he still been fully human, they would each be at least a few inches taller than he had been. L. Wolf was happy that he was able to still think somewhat clearly. These days he acted more on instinct than thought, but in quiet moments like this, he could focus. But today, he kept the kids busy, while Lacey and her husband Oscar had some private time. Well, at least my knees and other joints seemed to have come back online with the transformation. I was still an old wolf, but not as decrepit as I would have been as an old man. Okay, I wasn't that old. Hadn't even reached sixty. But it was the mileage, not the years that put wear on my carriage. He chuckled inwardly. May help that I can take off some other pressure by going on all fours. The longer arms still feel a little odd, but they seem to work well. Rumph! He barked out a command to the siblings when they started to get too rough. L2 had bitten down too strongly on his sister's Adele's arm. Uh, foreleg. Uh, whichever. She was bleeding. That's enough. Let me see Adele. The young female dogman. Dog girl, dog teen. She approached her grandpa and held out her injured limb for inspection. Old Wolf could see that she had held back tears. My brave young lady, so like her mother, he thought warmly. The gashes where her brother's fangs had scored her flesh, well, they were not deep. You'll be fine. Remember that we don't heal as quickly when we injure one another. Old too, you have to learn control. I know it's hard to balance practice and wanting to train for the real thing, but thinking during physical training helps us to think when the time comes to face danger. That puts us ahead of those that fight with pure fear and rage. Well, two bobbed his head and patted at his sister. He licked her wounds by way of apology and she seemed to accept. Now, the grandpa proclaimed, time to go hunt some food. And with that, he gave a grin that he had faced it in his earlier life, and would have made his bowels loosen. There it was, the ancient enemy, the wolf folk. Alpha M knew he'd smelled correctly, but it ran behind two young members of his own species as they chased behind a wild pig, straight towards the river, directly across from his perch. Now he was sure that the pair didn't realise the danger that loomed behind them. He'd smelled that wolf thing, and he and his pack had heard and seen it. He beckoned, and his mates and their young adult pups approached stealthily until all four of their ferocious heads gazed from a long rise along the bank. He rose, and the rest rose with him. No time to make a plan. They had to get across the flowing water and save the two youngsters from the monster. As they plunged into the water, Alpha M saw the two young ones plunge teeth and claws into the hide of the feral hog. It squealed in pain and fear as blood gushed from its neck and sides. It made it as far as the water's edge before it collapsed, the two adolescents completing the work they had begun. The wolf thing had stopped. Perhaps he's noted us. No, he's speaking to the young ones, directing them. Yet, as he and his pack pushed and swam through the deep part of the riverbed, the large creature noted them and called to the two adolescent dog people. They raced to his sides, flanked him, and took up defensive poses. They were together. Some demented, monstrous pack. 
Don't worry, a wolf told the young ones. They are kind with you. They will not like me, but when I smell them, I too feel hostility. As long as they do not immediately attack, we'll try talking. Or if they do attack, run back away and then cross paths. Make a big running circle back to the den. Prepare to fight them and howl like crazy to draw your mum and dad. They may be near and will come to help. What about you, Grandpa? Sweetadel asked, a little fear creeping into her voice, though not for herself. Her wolf's heart once again swelled with pride. I am a large, ferocious being, Adele. I will draw them away and then try to join you at the den. And there was no more time for planning. The strange pack had exited the river and now climbed up the low incline towards them. The four large dog people shook the water from the hair in turn. The spray sparkled in silver cascades of droplets that reflected the bright moonlight. And they parted and walked past the corpse of the pork supper that the Lacey Brooks pack had taken. A wolf issued a low warning growl from deep within his chest. Earl two attempted a similar sound. His chest heaved as he drew heavy breaths in anticipation of a fight. A wolf did not want one, so he first tried the warning. This is our territory, the land of the Lacey Brooks pack. These are her pups and I am her father, the old wolf. You may share our food, but then you must go back across the river. Of course, he didn't use those words, but a combination of sounds, annotations and gestures that conveyed the information. And a big alpha for the other pack stopped and gestured for the rest of his family to do so. You are the enemy. You have no right to the territory. How did you come to have two young ones of our kind? A wolf decided to tell a short version of the truth. It was his nature, even more so now that he spoke from instinct. I too feel anger at your smell, but I belong in my pack. Lacey is the Alpha. She was my child when we were both other beings. She was a puppy when one of the wolf folk bit her. I was a two-leg and took care of her. She changed. Later, we killed another wolf folk, but it bit me. She and her mate allowed me to live here, far from the two legs. And a big alpha growled in disapproval. If she cared for you in return, she should have killed you when you were bitten. Your kind are our enemy. Had she been a trueborn, she would have. A wolf made the equivalent of a shrug. These are my grandchildren. They are trueborn. Yet they record their love for the old two legs I was. A journey exchanged the young man of the strange pack who was near the same age as Adele and O2, had locked eyes with O2 and they had engaged in a contest of wills. The strange young adult kicked back some dirt in challenge. It was too much for the adolescent O2. He roared and charged down the gentle slope towards his adversary. They met and rolled down towards the water in a snarling, scrabbling heap of claws, fangs and raised hackles, all followed by pine straw, dirt and small rocks. A wolf surged forward, but Alpha M was closer and faster. He seized L2 by the scruff and flung him into the flowing river. And El Wolf's new nature took control, and he rammed Alpha M from behind to send him sprawling onto the muddy bank. Alpha M had a difficult time scrambling to his feet in the slimy muck, but his mate was on El Wolf and gave him time. El Wolf backhanded her with his powerful shoulder behind the blow and followed it with a slash from his other set of claws. He lunged in and bit at her throat, but ended up with a mouthful of upper chest and lower neck. At about that time, the young female dove into Old Wolf's legs and lashed her jaws onto his right knee. The bad one. He yelped. Adele had torn into the strange young male to finish the fight her brother had begun. Earl too had found his feet in the shallows and waded towards the struggles. He saw that her Alpha M was about to join the assault on Grandpa Earl and that his sister was holding her own with his initial foe. He plunged forward towards Alpha M's back as the big dogman rushed El Wolf from behind. He understood that the Alpha Dogman would be able to reach around and tear out Grandpa's throat before the werewolf even had a chance. Everything appeared to slow in L2's perception. His feet struggled to gain purchase in the mud 
and he knew that he would not reach the fight in time. And then a silver blonde streak flew into the affray and knocked Alpha M aside. A second, even larger streak joined in the tumble of fury and quickly turned the tide of the battle. O2 rushed ashore and pried the female's fangs from his grandpa's knee. He pushed her onto her back and roared at her to submit, which she did. His sister had finished the fight he'd begun and had the young male on his back. Earl Wolf had released the pressure of his bite and allowed the adult female to cringe in defeat. Her tail tucked as she issued a slight whine of pain. Lacey and Oscar had Alpha M pinned and when he realised that his entire pack was defeated, he sprayed a little urine, tucked his tail and relaxed. Lacey left Oscar to watch the other adult male and bounded over to check on her children. Well, they were fine, though their ruffs still stood on end and each breathed heavily from the effort and increasingly in the realisation that they had won the previously hopeless fight. She turned to Earl Wolf who grinned at her through the pain in his knee. He had protected her young ones with his life and once and for all removed any doubt about his new nature. After the situation was cleared up, Lacey, as Alpha of her pack, ordered the Alpha M pack to leave and go across the river. She offered them no food and made it clear that if they crossed into her pack's territory again, well, there would be no mercy. This was the law of the wild. Oscar loomed beside her and flexed and growled in support, and so Alpha M had little choice. As he reached the near bank, last to cross behind his pack, Lacey called to him. If you see others of our kind, let them know about the wolf folk who is of our pack. If you or any other harms him, we will eliminate their entire pack. And Alpha M growled wordlessly, a way to save face, and then turned and quietly entered the water. Lacey and the rest watched them disappear into the foliage on the other side of the river. Her entire pack remained vigilant for several minutes before any of them spoke. She glanced around at each member. Any bad injuries? Her children denied having anything more than some cuts, scrapes and bruises. And L2 had a nice set of gashes down his left flank. They were not deep and he denied any pain as he huffed his chest in display. Earl Wolf indicated his knee. I'll be on all fours. Uh, threes. For a few days at least. She had a hard bite for a young one. She bit deep and twisted. Ab is well done, he added ruefully. Oscar patted him on the shoulder in gratitude and a gesture he had learned from his former handler, Tom Knox. And a wolf grinned. So, did you have a fun vacation? We can talk about it after midnight lunch. Now for M checked his pack members. He was angry at the Lacey Brooks pack well, he was the least injured of his own, and the two adults had taken him by surprise. One more moment, and I would have ripped the throat from that wolf thing. He growled internally. He looked at his mate. Hard to believe that any pack would take in such a creature. I say, if we meet any others of our kind, we should team with them to put a stop to the monster. None of us are safe with that one hunting our land. His mate indicated her agreement, as did his son. He reached out and cuffed his son. You acted on your own before we were ready as a pack. Foolish to pick a fight when one was not needed. Now his son, Giraffe, cringed in submission to his alpha. Apologies, father. I just felt angry. It was something in the air. A smell. The young mouse stared at me when I... When I looked his way, I didn't mean to get anyone hurt. His mother answered before his father could. Learn from your mistakes, son. Anger can be useful, but not too much, or it may cause us to slip. As for the smell, we do not blame you. The wolf stink angers all of our kind. They are our oldest enemy. Alpha M growled agreement. Let's hunt. We need to heal and to consider what to do. I will not have a monster for a neighbor. 
Stop! A wolf called out at the end of the early morning sparring match. Oscar, you won that time. I'm sorry, Lacey. Lacey grinned and huffed some of the breath that he now found so delightful to smell. I agree, father. It's getting better. She reached up and cuffed her husband playfully. Oscar simply grinned and huffed in return. The two youngsters had stayed back as neutral observers. Among their pack, they took turns practicing their skills, something they'd learned from Grandpa El Wolf and their father, who had been professionally trained in his previous life. Grandpa looked at the pair to ask what they had observed, and they caught Adele staring off into the distance. Adele, you want to join us, or have you seen a squirrel? Adele looked sharply at her grandfather. I see buzzards, seven of them, back over the ridge to the north. And the rest of the pack members observed for a moment before Oscar spoke. Maybe something large enough for us to take from them. Or if it's too rotten to eat, might be fun to have a roll in it before we let the birds get back to their mill. Everyone agreed and gaping with anticipation, dashed off into the trees to find whatever carcass awaited. They stopped short at where the body lay. They practiced their planned, standard approach, and once they had eyes on the target, only O2 crept forward, a lone scout on point. The mangled carcass was large, unusually so, but he scented no predators in the immediate area, only the feathered scavengers that now swarmed over their repulsive repast. The carcass smelled of recent death and held no signs of rot. He had never observed such a creature. It smelled like a... like a cow, yes, but with more of a wild odour than the creatures that the two legs kept as a ready supply of meat. His parents had forbidden him to take such creatures unless they wandered into the forest. Well, this one had heavy, coarse hair all over a hump at the shoulder, and short black horns on a large head. Well, it looked very tough, and he instantly wanted to hunt one. Well, he took one last whiff as the wind finally shifted, and then signalled for the rest of the pack to advance. No word for this. When I was a two-leg, we called them bison. The more that had grown to replace his human mouth mangled the bee, but he had succeeded in creating a new word in the shared instinctive language of were-folk. He continued, Related to cattle, but different. Fierce and wild. I never would have thought to see one this far from two-leg territory. Two legs breed them, but why well, it's rare to see them in the forest, especially alone. Maybe it was driven to these parts by a predator. Lacey grinned and huffed. I saw these on TV when Valerie watched with me. She thought I would like nature programs. She was right. You are right, father. I always saw them on grass or on plains. Oscar and the children remained silent. None of them had an experience with this strange creature. Lacey looked around at her pack. Go out from the carcass and Look for signs of what may have killed the creature, and how it may have been brought here. It looks like only parts of it have been eaten. Internal organs, delicacies. Be wary, the killer may still be near, waiting to return to its kill. Each member of her pack attempted to find signs of large predators. There were some smells, and a wolf detected the scent of something that smelled almost similar to the type of creature he had been once upon a time. And then, in the light of the far-setting moon, he saw a track. The hunger gnawed at the recently altered being. It tore at his guts and at his mind. He had been very peaceable until recently. That pack of two-leg creatures had caught another creature that held in a cage in the place of pain that smelled of death. He would gotten too close to the thing, and it had bitten him. It had hurt, and he had been sick for a while, and then he fell into a deep sleep. When he awakened, he did not feel right. He had grown, and he had hungered for blood and flesh. Well, he enjoyed flesh before, but now it was all he craved. His face had enlarged, grown outwards. His baboon-like mouth had grown into an elongated one, like those of the other flesh eaters in these woods. And this evening, he had been near the pasture, when the two legs raised the great shaggy beasts. The hunger had overwhelmed him. He leapt the fence and easily outpaced one of the larger, older creatures. 
We turned to face him as he approached on all fours, but he'd surprised it by standing on his hind legs and remaining there on his final approach. He kicked the enormous bovine under its shaggy chin and then leapt upon its back. He seized the shot, black horns, and twisted until he had access to the face and neck. The shaggy monster roared at first, but its bellows of rage soon turned to cries of agony until all that was left was a mewling whine. And then, silence. In the distance, he could smell the creatures that kept these large, wonderful prey animals inside fence lines. He knew they were dangerous, especially with their loud sticks that shot fire and destruction. He would normally have to have dragged such a large kill, but with his newfound growth and strength and ferocity, he found that he could quickly cut the corpse and have the rest of the carcass across his shoulders. He did so and ran towards the fence. He leapt it with ease, burdened an oar, and ran rapidly into the forest. He knew where to go, a nice clearing near a stream where he could drink his fill of cold water and then dine at his ease. By the time he neared the clearing, the sun was well up and it made him feel a little tired. It had been a long night and he'd run a good distance carrying a heavy load. He drank his fill of water and then lay in the shadows to relax for a moment. He awakened to the sounds of growls and yips in the near distance, near his kill. Ah, big one. A wolf shared his opinion of the prince he'd found. Booger squatches down this way are usually small, no taller than I was, but bigger and stronger. Only the second time I've seen tracks and the others, well, they were much smaller. Something odd about the smell too. See if you notice. Each member of Lacey's pack sniffed the pug marks and rose. Oscar spoke first. Wolf stink, like Grandpa here. And he flicked his chin towards a wolf. Mixed with the smell of booger squatch. The rest of the pack agreed. Lacey called for them to be on alert. We've never run into anything like this. Didn't know booger squatches could be turned. A wolf gave the equivalent of a shrug. Theory is, they are related to two legs in some way, maybe more so than we knew. Get him warm, maybe we should take some meat and go settle for the day. Lacey grinned and huffed and the rest of her pack quickly joined her. The grins were wiped immediately from their features when a roar issued from just downhill, and an enormous form leapt from the brush and strode towards the party. I was bigger than any creature any of them had seen going up on two legs. A good eight feet tall, heavy, and with broad shoulders and a deep, wide chest. The head was large, sloped upwards, and equipped with long fangs that overlapped the lips on the long and heavy snout. It dove on top of the bison's body and rolled forward. It rose again. The big prey animal now slung across its shoulders and ran forwards, and then quickly turned and disappeared, heading deep into the trees. Lacey and her family each stared at one another, and then her. They had all taken time to take up defensive postures, but none of them had reacted to stop the overlarge predator. They were fortunate that it had only wanted to recapture its repast. Lacey beckoned, and they strung out in the direction opposite of that in which the creature had fled. When they found a good place to settle in for the day, near a nice cold stream, they paused to discuss what they'd observed. Lacey said that it was a creature with what El Wolf understood to be a Gugwe, a face eater. Ah, uh, he'd heard of them. He'd spent a great deal of his two-leg retirement studying cryptic creatures. In part, to understand his little pup Lacey and what had happened to her and to the Elberts and poor Pete Barnum and to Oscar and then to him. He enjoyed his studies. It was an intriguing way to while away the empty hours. In the early days, he hadn't taken the existence of such creatures seriously. He could only imagine how Earl Brooks would have reacted to have seen a wolf peering through the window on a dark night. The Lacey Brooks pack had perhaps discovered the origins of yet another legendary creature. It started with two other legendary creatures, a skunk ape and a werewolf. The cryptid family trees... Why, oh, they're getting dense, he thought. 
He once again pondered what would happen as more and more two legs left the cities and moved out into the countryside. The wilderness areas would shrink, and the cryptids and two legs would increasingly find themselves in close proximity. He glanced at his sleeping grandchildren and spared a moment of concern for their future. And then he heard a frog croak down near the stream, and his thoughts, more tenuous in nature these days, turned towards pouncing and gobbling. The Alpha M pack ranged along the river and scouted for good crossings. They wanted to be ready when the time came to take on the Lacey Brooks pack and their pet monster. Alpha M himself had wrestled with the problem. They couldn't risk having such a beast so close. Their children, or oh, they were nearly grown. They'd be off to find mates soon and form packs of their own. Hopefully adjacent to his and his mates' territory, so they could still hunt together on occasion. He knew that his kind tended to have only one set of twins per couple for a lifetime, and so their populations never grew overly large. Many mishaps could occur that killed off young ones before they had a chance to reach adulthood. But he was angry that the slightly younger pups of the Lacey Brooks pack had defeated his two. Well, they were not as large, but fought the way that more experienced dog people did. When they reached a fork where a small stream entered a river from the other side. The river bent inward, so they should be able to cross and follow the stream for a while without getting into a fight. It was time to start looking for food anyway, before dawn lit the eastern sky and cast grey, waning lights between the boles of the big pines. But the stream was a good place to hunt. Many animals would be taken at last drink before they turned towards their dens and sleep. And if that failed, he could slap some fish from the current. He caught an odd, rank smell. It reminded him of the Earl Wolf, but with overtones of... Skunk ape? How odd. He caught another scent, again close to familiar, but not exact. It was tainted with the odour of freshly spilled blood and entrails. Shortly, he and his pack bounded into a small clearing and discovered the remains of a large creature that had been almost entirely consumed. They found the scent trail of the odd-smelling monster that led away from the stream into the deep woods. Well, there was enough meat to scavenge a quick snack, and they partook and then determined to hunt for a full meal. But Alpha M was worried. He now had two monsters to face. The territory was becoming infested with the wolf folk. Well, he was hungry again. The big beast had provided a satisfying meal, more even than he could eat. Still, one must feed. He still struggled to understand the changes that occurred within his body. He'd always dined on a variety of food, but now he craved only meat, blood, bones, marrow, and soft innards. He had grown. His snout was now long, and his temper, I was shot. He rarely encountered those of his own kind. They were scarce at any time, so there was no being he could ask. He decided that instead of setting up a trap, he would track and stalk his prey. He'd encountered the trail of a sounder of feral pigs, for he enjoyed the taste of them. Their meat was filling, and they were plentiful. He could usually take one or more without facing serious opposition from the larger boars. He eventually caught the sounds as well as the scents from up ahead. He ranged outwards to remain downwind of the sounder, and he would soon be able to see and thus select his victims. Then the group of porcines startled. Several squealed in alarm, and the entire mass turned to flee towards him. He took advantage and selected a medium-sized porker as it noticed him and started to run. He slammed his clawed hand into one side of its head and sunk his fangs into its neck, which he quickly broke. Where he rose, chest heaving in triumph and the exhilaration of a fresh kill, only to see large figures bounding through the trees towards him. A hunting pack of dog people. <sighs> this forest is infested with things, he thought angrily. He scooped up his bounty, turned and fled into the heavy brush. 
He hoped that the pack would be too focused on acquiring supper to pay him any attention. But he soon heard hunting howls as they remained on all fours and plunged after him. He had to run while upright and carrying a freshly killed ham on the hoof. He made it to a muddy ravine over a seasonal creek and leapt forward into the darkness. On the other side was a tree with a crook about 18 feet off the ground. He completed a layup leap that would make an NBA player envious and lodged a meat in the tree. He dropped to all fours and ran as fast as he could. Eventually he outpaced his pursuers for a while. Yet, as he slowed to listen and sniffed the air, he detected a telltale sense of one of the pack and heard sounds from behind. They were attempting to surround him and cut off any chance of turning. He grew angry when he realised that they would force him to fight. But he was hungry, after all. Wasn't it enough that they had disrupted my mill? Now they wanted to hound and harass him. How dare they! He looked for a place to make his stand to make them pay for their tyrannity. Alpha M stayed directly on the trail. His mate ran along behind. He sent the children to either flank, since they were fast. He wanted them to cut off any chance that this monster would escape. He hadn't expected to meet it so soon, yet here it was, taking food that belonged to his pack. He slowed a little to listen and heard nothing. The crashing progress of the creature from up ahead had died out, and he was concerned that it had turned towards one of the young ones. He raised his head to test the air and abruptly halted and gagged on the stench that rose ahead of him. There was foulness of every kind and choked his breath. His mate drew up beside him and coughed a few times. What is that stink? She gasped. Now for M communicated as best he could. I don't know. It makes my nose sting, my stomach sick, my eyes water. He stood and used his hand paws to wipe at his tortured nose. A huge hand grasped the side of his head, and razor claws sunk into the back of his neck. His head was dashed against the trunk of a large tree, behind which his attacker had lain in ambush. The creature slammed his head into the tree a few more times, until his head held nothing that functioned. His mate, startled at first, and still affected by the stink, rushed to grapple with their attacker. They tumbled to the forest floor and rolled, thrown up leaves and detritus shed by the natural world around them. They pummeled and clawed at one another, each attempted to gain purchase with their powerful jaws. The face eater managed to engulf her throat in his mighty maw and closed it inexorably to cut off her wind and to tear into the vulnerable flesh. He gave his head a quick shake to rattle her senses, then turned it abruptly so that her neck snapped and her eyes grew dull as life drained from her. The Gugwe rose and howled in triumph. The blood of his enemy trickled down his throat, inside and out, and he marveled at his own strength and prowess. He urinated on the bodies of the freshly slain dog people, and then ran back along his back trail, ready to complete his repast. The two young dog people had run ahead, closing in on their prey, heedless that it no longer made sounds. Eventually, they saw one another and stopped, surprised that the monster they trailed was not in between them, had not fallen into their trap. Then they heard the howl back along the trail. They knew it was not the sound of their kind, and with a glance at one another, they barreled back towards the place where their parents' bodies lay cooling and rapidly disintegrating into the waning moonlight. They howled in pain and consternation, alone in a world before they had expected to be. And Giraffe wanted to resume the chase to seek vengeance on the monster, but his sister persuaded him to remain with her. If the creature had taken out their parents, they would not stand a chance against it. They would need help. 
Lacey was on the watch when she caught the scent of another pack, two scents she had caught before and whom she had warned to stay out of her pack's territory. She growled and awakened the others, who gathered and then searched with all senses attuned in each direction as had, as they had practiced. A wolf, who stood to her immediate left, huffed and inhaled once more. Got it. The two young ones. Perhaps they had stayed as young ones sometimes do. He gave a meaningful glance towards L2. Oscar issued a low and menacing growl. Maybe, but they have already tried to harm us. The parents may be along soon, circling us even now. He looked towards Adele and then to Earl too. They both indicated that they smelled, heard, nor saw anything, and then redoubled their efforts as their father would expect them to do. The approaching figures came slowly, but did not attempt to hide their presence. Lacey issued the challenge. Stop. We have warned you. What are you doing in our territory? The young male spoke for the duo, who both wore hangdog expressions. I am Giraffe. This is my sister, Yeruff. Our parents, they are dead. A monster killed them. A thing that stinks like the, like the skunk apes, but also smells of wolf folk. Like him. He pointed a claw in a manner of suggestion and accusation at a wolf, who growled in a baso guttural manner that was almost too low for even the sharp ears of his companions, at the accusing claw of his own swell foe. The Lacey Brooks pack members remained silent and waited for her to respond to the intruders. She made him wait for an uncomfortable moment. We call the creature a Gugway. It was once a skunk ape. Now it is more. Tell us what happened. After Giraffe relayed their story, Lacey ordered a pair to step away from the circle of her pack while they conferred. Hmm, I smell a trap. Old Wolf appinned. Oh, too quickly joined his grandfather. Yes, that is the one who attacked me. He cannot be trusted. And Oscar considered for a moment. Not sure. That Alpha M wasn't too bright. Definitely a natural born dogman. Not turned. Adele nodded along with her father. They smelled afraid. Something happened. Not sure, though. I remember fighting a male and beating him after L2 had tackled him. Lacey listened to the thoughts of the others and then offered her a decision. I too smelled the distress and I too disliked them for attacking my children and father. We can watch them on our turns at Sentry. Tonight they can show us where their parents died. We can use them to help us with the Gugway. We cannot allow it to stay if it can so easily kill our kind. Mm, stupid or not, Alpha M was powerful. Yet both he and his mate perished. We can help prepare the young ones for survival. Yuck! And Gruff cautiously approached the large old forest giant where their parents had met their fates. Lacey and her pack remained back inside the tree line and circled the site to ensure that there were no lingering threats. The two remaining members of the Alpha M pack stood next to the rapidly deteriorating remains and looked around in confusion. In their pack, Alpha M would send a scout, but they never truly worked as a team to support the scout on approach. Shortly, the Lacey Brooks pack melted into the small space from every direction almost simultaneously. It was a little startling to the already distraught siblings. Lacey looked at her team for reports. Only Oscar had noted anything unusual. Central and tracks lead away from this place, crossed by these two. He indicated Yeruff and Guruff. Maybe two days ago, big creature, long stride, weight was on the front of the feet and 
Dart and leave Stroom behind. Definitely moving fast. None of the others had anything to add. Lacey inspected the remains of Alpha M and his mate, but there was not much more than a puddle, and their kind rapidly disintegrated after death. She looked at the two young dog people, near adulthood, a little older than her own children, yet they had a lost look about them. They would need time to process their trauma and grief. The best way was to get them hunting for the Gugwe, but they would need some training in how a proper pack worked as one. She caught the attention of the twins. You may join us if you like, but you will have to learn our ways. You just saw how we approach a hunting site. We all take responsibility for an area and overlap with those of our pack mates on either side. We will practice for a few nights before we go after the Face Eater. It will feed again tonight if it hasn't already. We will go back to our territory for now and train. She nodded to a wolf whose leg wound had improved to indicate that he should take point and they set off into the forest to cross the river to their home. And there were more of the dog people in his territory. He smelled the two who had helped their parents chase him, and now there were five, no, four others. The fourth was more like himself. Perhaps that one would be an ally. Maybe it was a prisoner of the dog people. Oh, he could not tell from the tracks. He followed the first set that had approached the slaves on the ground, where his two victims had perished. It led to the river. He followed the second trail that led away from the site. It was more circuitous than the first and came out at a different crossing of the same river. Their pack must hold the other side of the river. But he decided as he gazed at the sparkles of moonlight on the rushing water. And he listened carefully. Off in the distance on the far side, above the sound of the rushing water and wind in the trees, he heard the howls of a successful hunt followed shortly by deep growls and barks. Mm, their buck is hunting or fighting, he surmised. Perhaps both. And he decided that he would take the fight to them, hunt them before they crossed the river once more. He would need to take them individually, or at worst in pairs. With a simple plan, he had taken out the two adults in the first pack. He felt confident that he could do the same with this one. First, he wanted supper. Hunting and fighting dangerous enemies was nothing to do on an empty stomach. He found and began to stalk a herd of deer. As much as he enjoyed pork, venison was his favourite. He trailed until he knew he was close, and then circled to ensure that he was downwind. He caught glimpses of the peaceful creatures through the branches of the thick vegetation. He selected the one he wanted, it was an older buck, and the meat would be tough, but there would be plenty of it, and this one appeared to be a little slow. He prepared himself to spring as the buck drew near, mindlessly cropping at the grass. Suddenly, the entire herd raised their heads in unison at some indistinct sound. They paused, nerves taut, and then sprang away towards safety. The Gugwe jumped into action even as he knew that it was too late. He issued a roar that he hoped would freeze his prey. I worked on one of the younger, Servidae, and she froze for just a second, not sure which danger to heed. It was enough, and the Gugwe swiped her small, sharp-featured head from her delicate neck. Blood found him, and he took a quick slurp as the body sank to the ground. He instantly stood and turned to face several directions in turn as he scanned the trees for whatever had spooked his intended meal. Had he not possessed the heightened senses that seemed to have emerged since the wolf thing bit him, he might not have seen it. The old man of the forest, the Sasquatch, tall and savage, lay sprawled on the ground, flattened as though a part of the pine straw and bracken. He issued a low growl of challenge and gaped his jaws to expose his fangs. Drool slabbered from his lips and dripped to the earth near his feet. The old men were rare in this land, and 
had not been his enemies, but they had always used their size to intimidate his kind, and to take what they wanted. Now he was as big as this one. This encounter, oh, it would be different. Lacey and her pack roamed the territory and practiced with their new additions. The pair seemed willing enough to learn, though Giraffe was occasionally showing impatience with the frequent pauses to listen and sniff. He preferred the methods of his dead father, yet Giraffe thrived on the practice and put in a total concentration, likely as a way to process the grief she felt. It was she who kept Giraffe focused, as a positive as the young dogman was capable of being. Lacey, Oscar, and our wolf kept the pack busy. The threat they faced was a serious one. Besides, the hormones of the young dog people would be a distraction if they were not forced to concentration and fatigue. Adele did not seem to be interested in giraffe, and he was all but too oblivious to anything but revenge. Adele, too, often stole glances and whiffs of your rough. Only natural. Grandpa Wolfie smiled to himself. She's attractive and often seems fairly sweet. Just glad Adele was not into bad dogs. Uh, boys. Whatever. His lack of wits had turned away any potential interest from her. And she was smart like her mother and preferred the same in a potential mate. He balked at the thought. She's my granddaughter. She's not old enough for that sort of thing anyway. Oh, they worked their way up river, training and hunting, all the while working out plans for when they would cross into the Gugwe's land. They reached the boundary of their own territory and turned back down river, once more on a hunt for food. They found a sounder of pigs, and after a brief stalk and fight, during which they practiced their team skills, they howled and barked in triumph. Lacey hoped that the face eater could hear them, that their triumphant calls would echo to its ears and send it pacing in fear. And she knew that that was an unlikely scenario. But I can always hope. She gaped and huffed, and with a fond memory, she had learned that expression from her sister Vale, whom she missed and had not seen for several seasons. Then growls and a small bark broke her happy reverie. Giraffe and Earl Two were squared off and both literally bristled in anger, ruffs erect and hackles raised in building fury. As she had been waiting for it. The conflict had brewed over the past few days, and so she listened to and observed what they said to one another before she took action. She glanced at Oscar and Earl Wolf too, to ensure that they would wait for her before any of them acted. Always something nasty to say about the way we work. Gruff snarled. Yet you like to watch my sister work. Oh, too, not to be outsnarled, replied. If you could learn to do anything but leap and attack, you would not need constant guarding. Your sister is a worthy addition. You are not. She listens and works with the team, or you soak and whine like a mewling pup. Lacey wasn't sure she had shared all the sentiments but she was proud that her son made a logical argument. Of course, in their language. It was hardly eloquent, but she understood the nuances and inflections that her boy had included. She had a doubt that Garuff looked puzzled and then a little angry, for he was really slow. At least he retorted rather than fling himself into a physical fray that he clearly preferred as a means to solve arguments. He slavered a little, and a rope of draw hung from his lower jaw. Always the talk about caution, of making sure. We can't be safe all the time. Sometimes we have to be brave, not cower like prey. I all too had his own blind spot, his pride. Giraffe had just called him prey, an intimation that he lacked courage. Lacey enjoyed for a brief moment, sir. Giraffe looked startled when L2, who was short, thinner, and younger than his opponent, roared and pounced. As she let them tumble around and scrap for a moment, and each inflicted minor wounds on the other, and then let forth a harsh bark. Stop! 
L2 stopped clawing and biting and attempted to disengage from his larger foe, yet Garuff took advantage of the suddenly halted aggression and rolled the younger dogman onto his back. Oscar and Old Wolf stepped in and seized each of Garuff's arms and lifted him bodily out of the fight. He struggled briefly, but Lacey strode forward and bit into his throat. It wasn't a killing or wounding bite, but it was enough pressure to alert even Garuff's angry mind that it was time for him to obey the Alpha. As all parties shuffled out into a rough circle, Garuff glared around at the others. Oh, I see. We're not welcome in your pack. You gang up on me like the wolves you so clearly admire. Lacey huffed, but Oscar responded. Fool, pup! Our pack is successful because we work together. You have done well enough in practice, but it is clear that when blood rises, you revert back to mindless attacks. The wolves of the forest work together and win. Most wolf folk do not, yet Grandpa does. He overcomes his instincts every day to contribute to this pack. I am the largest and strongest, yet my mate is Senior Alpha because she is the smartest and most fierce. He saw that L2, who stood by watchfully, it started to look satisfied. Don't! He snapped at his son. You dove in like a fool and attacked a larger and stronger opponent with no support. You are a disappointment. L2 looked at Bashton, hung his head at a deserved admonishment. I am sorry, father, mother, grandpa. I was just... He trailed off. He knew that excuses would not help him. It was a bad judgment on my part. He had been impressed. His dad rarely spoke so many words at one time. He was usually the strong, silent type. So it must have been important wisdom he imparted. Lacey carefully watched Giraffe, who looked puzzled that the pack leaders had criticized one of their own. This is our way, Giraffe. If you do not like it, well, enough. Yet, until we end the threat of the Gugway, we must work together. I don't expect you and L2 to take to one another as brothers. But I demand that you find a way to work together. And she looked into L2's eyes. Both of you. Garuff wanted to stare defiantly and bristle, but he knew that that would not work and that he and his sister needed a Lacey Brooks pack for the moment. He hung his head in submission. After a moment, Lacey huffed out her acceptance. Good. Let's eat. The face eater snarled in renewed challenge and stepped forward towards the Sasquatch. His hairs all stood on end and he assumed a puff look, incongruous with his hostile intentions. The old man of the forest rose and struck a defiant pose. They circled and postured. A low menacing growls issued from the chests of each of the enormous beings. The Gugwe charged first. He gave no warning roar. He just rushed towards his foe. Mouth agape and turned to seize the short throat and neck of the Sasquatch, and with his head set almost directly on its shoulders. That worthy calmly stepped aside and drove his long arm with a hard fist at the end into the side of the Gugwe's jaw. It followed up with a stump of its oversized foot on the lower paw of the monster. The face eater countered with a swipe of its claws and raked the old man's side. The Sasquatch winced in pain and drove his other fist into the body of the Gugwe. They exchanged mighty blows and eventually grasped one another in an attempt to gain leverage. The old man of the forest, more accustomed to his own style of combat than the relatively new Gugwe, soon had the monster on its back. As he attempted to grasp the thing's throat, the Gugwe raised his head, turned it, and snapped its teeth closed around the hairy forearm of the Sasquatch. The being grunted with a pain, but raised its other fist, now filled with a rock, to strike down on the side of the Gugwe's exposed head, until the monster slumped and went limp. The old man of the forest 
throttled the beast until he was sure it was thoroughly dead. And then for insurance, tugged and tore until he separated the head from the torso. He set the severed pate on a high branch as a trophy and as a warning to others of its kind or to any other monsters that wanted to enter his territory. And then he strode on his long legs to the river to wash his wounds. He soon realized that the wounds carried something more than a chance of infection. We have trained long enough, Lacey announced. Eat well this evening. Tonight we cross the river and hunt down the face eater. After a nice meal that consisted of a brace of rabbits and a pile of fish, the Lacey Brooks pack set out on their hunt for the inedible monster. They were determined to find and kill the face eater, the gugway that had caused them so much worry and effort for the past ten nights. They started at the far end where the river narrowed and deepened. They leapt across and made their beachhead on the far side, then set off to methodically search the territory across the border of their realm. The old man of the forest had sickened, then slept, and as he did, he changed. He did not take on the features of the wolf folk as had the little skunk ape. Instead, while his features coarsened and his snout lengthened some, he grew larger and his skin grew harder as he transformed into what the first two legs to arrive had called a stone-skinned man. He was still a being of flesh, but the flesh had hardened and become rough. His hair had grown longer and shaggier, and his temperament descended into a hair-trigger anger and a constant aggression. Oh, it was very different from his normal nature. He resented the changes. It made him furious, and he struck out at the trees around him, snapping branches and destroying boles and roots. He found a large rock and raised it above his head. It felt right to do so, and he exulted when the rock struck the water in the river. It careened off of the other rocks that rested just under the surface and bounced into the forest on the other side. He was powerful, and he determined to revel in that power. He felt hungry and quietened his agitation as his stomach rumbled. He rumbled back in anger at the challenge he presumed from his own midsection. And then he eyed his immediate surroundings. He selected a set of rocks and set out into the trees, upstream, to a place where he knew that lesser creatures crossed. He would slam a rock or two into whatever prey he found and then eat his fill. Then he would go find other targets for the rocks. He liked throwing them at things and smashing. Ha <laughs> he definitely liked smashing things. A lacy's pack stormed over the river and began the methodical search for scents and signs of the face eater. They followed the winding course as it flowed through the trees on either side. They expected to encounter wildlife and hoped that they could catch the gugway out hunting. I would make things easier. Oscar was on point and halted a sniff to cock his ears forward and down towards the river's banks. They had to cut through a bend in the river and had just started to approach the watercourse as it completed its turn and bent to meet them. He craned his neck and made a sour face. Lacey moved up beside him as he glanced at her. My smell. Something. At least his fresh blood. The face eater. Or at least his fresh blood. Uh, and maybe mm, something worse. They alerted the rest of the team and then moved forward silently, each pack member silent and alert, treading carefully. Ruff spied the rotten and fragmented remains of the Gugwe and its rapidly disintegrating skull grinning at them from a tree limb. The pack spread out in a perimeter, each with all senses focused on the surrounding woods. When they set out on the trail of the new and greater threat, something none of them had smelled before. Yugruff led the way. Her brother and Elty worked either side of the trail, just behind her but out on the flanks. 
Earl Wolf and Lacey followed in file, prepared to swarm any threat. Oscar took his turn as rear guard, along with Adele. They covered the gap left open between the front flankers and the point scout. The trail led to a clearing. Or at least it had recently become a clearing. It had been a more protected place with a fallen tree and some large rocks. The odor here, oh, it was strong. And the creature they trailed had definitely denned in the clearing before tearing it to shreds. The tracks now led down towards the river, to the primary ford that the pack used for hunting and fishing. And as you rough, rounded a large tree and cautiously stepped forward, a boulder hurtled towards her and smashed into her chest. The force slammed her body back into the heavy trunk and, other than the wet noises of a broken open chest cavity, she died without a sound. Giraffe leapt forward into the brush near the fort. L2 followed suit. They both stopped abruptly when they saw what lay ahead. Another boulder hurtled from an enormous beast and just missed Giraffe, where it slammed into the muddy bank and splattered him with dark mud. Oh, too wisely stepped aside and crouched behind the large tree that had acted as a backstop for the monster's rock throwing, and on the other side of which lay the remains of your rough. He called to the rest of the pack, Cover! It's throwing big rocks! Lacey and her wolf found the largest trees near O2 and crouched behind them. Oscar and Adele completed the line of their flanks. Garoff had plunged forward once more to engage the creature that had killed his sister. A heavy log flew from the brush and struck just in front of him. He leapt into the air as it bounced so that, instead of breaking his legs, it simply sent him sprawling. The bottoms of his feet bruised and bleeding. L2 saw the movement when the thing threw the log. He pointed for the others in the pack, and they moved out to flank the beast while it focused on Garuff. The brave young dogman rose to his feet despite the incredible pain and prepared to fend off the brute that now emerged from the brush and rushed towards him. L2 had decided that two or more could play the hurling game. He picked up a fallen branch and flung it forward, end over end like a throwing axe, where it struck the Russian Janosqua on the nose. The limb was mostly rotten, so it did little damage, but it brought the gargantuan creature to a startled halt. Giraffe continued his mad rush and impacted the stone skin in its midsection, his teeth and claws scrabbling to enter the flesh of his enemy. He may as well have attacked one of the limestone boulders that lined this bend in the river. The Genosqua picked up the steel chlorine and biting dogman and smashed him into the rocks. And there was a wet crunch of breaking bones that immediately extruded through flesh and the splash of blood as it exited a large body instantly to spatter on the rocks and water. Earl two had scrambled towards the rapids and found a large stone. He threw it as hard as he could at the towering wall of flesh. Well, it struck true, high on the beast's breast, but bounced off and flew into the brush. Well, the Janosqua brushed at his chest and then glared towards the young dogman. It began another charge, only to have a larger rock slam into its upper back. It fell forward with the added momentum. As it struck the shallow water of the ford strewn with rocks and boulders, another projectile struck it in the back of the head, and then two more struck its body. L2 used the opportunity to run back into the cover of the trees. More rocks and a small log or two smashed into the Genosqua as it sprawled for a moment in the stream bed. And then, incredibly, it rose, shaking off the ferocious impacts that would have crushed a lesser being. It was clearly injured, yet the thickened hide had protected its vital organs. Or it rose, prepared to fight. It threw back its head and bellowed a deep-throated challenge to its tormentors. I all too record that a rotten tree limb that struck its face had apparently done as much damage as the small boulders had done striking its body. He searched around quickly and found a nice stone about the size of the creature's fist. But he carefully aimed and, as the Genosqua's head lowered back to face his enemies, O2 let fly. The stone struck the monster and its nose and blood sprayed outward 
as his mighty head lowered backwards. A dark grey streak rushed forward from O2's 2s right flank and slammed into the ogreish body. The long snouted face clamped onto the Genosqua's face, and then ripped the flesh as the weight of O Wolf tugged free the chunk of nose that O2 had broken. Owl Wolf landed on all fours and scampered back across the water. The Genosqua swung blindly at him and missed, even as Oscar landed on his back and bit off one ear while mangling the other with his claws. The creature sank to its knees in distress. Oscar leapt free as its enormous hands raked its own head while trying to dislodge him. No sooner was Oscar free than Adele ran forward on all fours until she reached the gargantuan head. She grasped the chin with both hands, vaulted upwards, springing from her hind legs, and forced the head back to expose th the throat. Lacey finished the job by sinking her fangs into the throat and tearing out a large chunk. Adele released her hold, and Lacey unclenched her jaws and ran forward over the back of the monster's now prone body. The Genosqua clutched at his throat, which jetted dark blood into the darker night. It tried to cry out in rage, but instead sank until his face was below the water. A crimson cloud polluted the stream for a moment, followed by the bubbles from the final expelled breath. In the coming days, a new set of rocks, the remains of the Genosqua, would riddle the river's bed. For now, though, the Lacey Brooks pack gathered around the body, looking for any signs of life. And when the first chunks of flesh fell away from the corpse, they were satisfied that it had perished. And the savage chorus of the triumphant pack of dog people sang upwards towards the stars. Later, they sat around and speculated that the vulnerable head of the Genosqua may have given a gugwe the Face Eater, its name. The smaller Gugwe had developed an effective means of taking down their larger foes. The creatures had clearly been natural enemies, as were dog people and wolf folk. Except for Grandpa, Adele proclaimed as she rested her head on the werewolf's massive shoulder. Lacey gaped and huffed in pride. We worked as more of a pack on that hunt than any other one. The stone skin should have given us more of a challenge, but our two found a weakness. We each paid attention, and each acted in concert to destroy the giant. She stretched out on the soft grass where they planned to bed down for the day. Oh, I take first watch. It's a relief to know that tonight we won't have to worry about any monsters in the woods. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolutely incredible update to this superb, superb series, Michael. Thank you so, so much for your dedication, patience, and uh, ferocious work. Really is so, so appreciated. And I just hope I've done this one justice, even with the uh, dodgy voice. <laughs> Guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, please do get in touch with me at the brand new contact email, which is contactthedeadone at gmail.com. A big, big thank you to each and every one of you, particularly the Cryptic Crew, for your patience over the last few months. It's been an absolute roller coaster journey after the uh, the past sort of eighteen months with this pandemic, pressures of a young family, etc., etc. But Mama raised a real one, and it ain't over to the fat lady sings, and I don't see no fat lady singing yet. So, as soon as I'm back to health, guys, I'm gonna be dropping content like it's going out of fashion. 
Make sure you've got your notification bell switched on to all notifications to stay up to date with all content and community posts. And above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.